okay? Okay. Great. So then we'll get started. Um, my name is Julie Morris. I am the chair of the Call CBPA uh, Scholarly Communications Committee um, based out of uh, the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, New Brunswick, um, where I am the Collections Analysis and Bibliometrics Librarian. I'm joined today by our panelists, who I will introduce in a moment, as well as Nicole Slip from uh, Mount St. Vincent University, who will be co-facilitating this webinar. I do want to start with a with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Call CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our okay. libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit, of the uh, Nunat Siavut, and uh, Nunatukavut, and the Innu of uh, Nitasinan, the Beotuk and the Mi'kmaq people. In Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New, in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wallistiqui, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. We at Call CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitudes to the First Peoples who, who share their ancestral homelands with us all. So with that being said, um, just a few housekeeping rules. I will ask that we turn off, if you're not presenting today, please turn off your video uh, as well as mute your microphones just to help with bandwidth. Um, we'll also hold questions until the end of the presentation and um, we'll, if you have questions throughout, feel free to put them in the chat and then we can get to them a little later on. Just make sure to write who they're directed to so that we know who uh, who to direct the questions to. Um, so without much further ado, I do want to introduce the webinar. We're going to have a panel of four experts in uh, throughout Canada talk about the their institutional repositories at their institutions and um, about trends and uh, and things that they think are important about um, about their IRs. So without further ado, I do want to introduce our panelists. First, we have Jeff Harder, who is the project director of the National Shared Repository and in, in Infrastructure, as well as the Associate University Librarian at the University of Alberta Libraries. Next, we have Jessica, or second, we have Jessica Lang, uh, who's the scholarly, scholarly communications <laughs> coordinator at McGill University Library. I do apologize. I'm a little, uh, I just got over COVID, so I'm kind of <laughs> struggling a little bit, but uh, I do apologize. Uh, third, we'll have Pierre Lazou, uh, who is the um, Bibliotheca Communication Savante at the Bibliotheque Université Laval. And finally, our last panelist uh, will be my colleague, Michael Mike Nason, uh, who is the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian here at the University of New Brunswick. So first I'd like to welcome Jeff Harder and um, yeah, if you want to share your slides and tell us about your institutional repository, we'd be very grateful. Well, I do. Hello, everybody. It's good to uh, to see so many people on the call. It's fantastic. Um, so we were given 10 minutes to talk um, about all the things, and I'm going to go off script here and not talk about my institutional repository, but talk a little bit about um, talk a little bit about shared national repository infrastructure. Can I just check in? Can everybody see the screen? Yep. yep. OK, cool, yes. cool, cool. Yep. cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, before I get into talking a bit about shared national repository infrastructure, I did want to acknowledge that I'm located on Treaty 6 territory the traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inui, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence and enrich our vibrant community. And community is really important. I think um, as I reflect back on my time working with the repository community, 
I really do have have grown to um, to appreciate just the depth of commitment. I think that individuals like yourselves have uh, put towards ensuring that we've got a very vibrant and rich scholarly communications ecosystem. I think that's really one of the strengths that we have to build on. Um, in terms of the current state, there is just an awful lot that could be said about the current state, and I'm excited to. To get into the, I guess the Q and A part of the uh, the panel um, discussion, and I think the experts are not me. The experts are really the others that are sitting on this panel here. But I've been around long enough to uh, to have made a few few observations about repositories. Um, it's been lots and lots of um, discussions about where we're at in terms of current state. Um, over the course of the last decade or two. Um, some of the more recent conversations, I think, have reflected in some of the survey work that's happened, have reflected that we've got a pretty diverse mosaic of um, activity that's in play for us. Um, this is an example of, you know, some of the various platforms that uh, folks like yourselves are involved with or running across the country. Um, there's a lot of strength, I think, in the diversity of what's happened there, but there's also some challenges too, just in terms of keeping all of those different um, different technologies um, moving forward at similar paces and with you know hopes and dreams of interoperability and all that uh, we think about. Definitely some themes have emerged, I think, over the course of many, many years, and these will be familiar, I think, to pretty much every person on the call. But we are often challenged, I think, from a resource point of view. Um, Kathleen Shear gets the credit for the repositories in Canada summary of current state, um, perhaps a few others as well. Uh, but this was a document that was pulled together for a, a Directors Plus meeting that happened, Carl Directors Plus meeting that happened in April of 2022. And some of the observations that came out of that are reflective of um, what you see on this slide, you know, things like digital preservation, something that I think most of us would agree is pretty core to the work of um, the work of our repositories and our repository teams is often not happening, at least not happening to the, the level that we would hope it would be happening. Um, and, you know, you can get pretty finger pointy about this if you want to, but I don't think that's a very constructive way of looking at the issue. I think part of the challenge here is just understanding that there's an awful lot going on and um, often we just don't have the resources to get all of those things um, done, at least not in a timely fashion that uh, that most of us hope that we, uh, hope and aspire to uh, to do. So where does that leave us? It leaves us a little bit like this fellow, this orchestrator, um, trying to keep things going and just more and more stuff flying towards us. This is my um, attempt to be culturally um, pop culture relevant, as Harry Styles was a conversation at the uh, the dinner table with my kids um, last night. So, um, you know, we, we talk often about interoperability, we talk about sustainability, but it's very, very challenging. I think the way, you know, we've orchestrated the repository environment, you know, in our local context, in our regional context, in our national and international context to really effectively be able to, to make things happen. And that's not to say lots of good work isn't happening. I want to be really clear about that. There's a huge amount of fantastic work that, that is happening. It's just that I think for many of us, we sometimes feel a little bit um, defeated at the end of the day that, you know, while we make progress, it just isn't quite as much as we maybe would have hoped. So I've been, I've been spending the last several months since I started my secondment with Carl um, having conversations with people, one-on-ones, one-on-twos, one-on-fives or sixes. Um, and this is an open door that if I haven't spoken with anyone on this call, um, I'll leave my contact info and I'd love to, to connect. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hearing many different themes emerge out of those conversations. And these are some of you know, the prevailing comments that I hear over and over again, things like I need a repository services to stop being an IT project. And it's not that, you know, there's, there's a dislike of IT or that uh, we don't, you know, absolutely need IT to help enable and support repository services. It's just in many of our contexts, I think the 
IT of the repository becomes the thing. It becomes the tail that wags the dog. It is where all of the energy in the room tends to go to um, in terms of, of uh, trying to, to drive our repository services forward. Um, there's really a sense that we don't all need to be doing this, um, that there's much more that could be shared. I think there's some envy, some jealousy when we look at things like, you know, the Portage uh, initiative, which has now morphed into um, the Alliance and, and um, other things at the national level. We look at the Borealis repository um, service for research data and, and wonder where was that, where is that level of support for the institutional repository? And I think a lot of people too are really, you know, struggling with, wrestling with the idea that, you know, outside of the library, outside of the repository team, people don't really care that much about the repository software in the sense that they just need it to be the work. They need it to be there. They need it to do what it needs to do. They need it to be infrastructure. Um, so times have changed significantly. Um, you know, I think we worry a lot more about impact and sustainability than competing with each other. You know, the days of every single institution needed to have a repository. Um, I think are, are slowly disappearing. Um, you know, we are the competition against the big vendors who are looking to eat our lunch. We need to, I think, be working together to, uh, to try to, um, you know, create the best scholarly environment, research environments that we can. We need to figure out this issue of scarce local resources, which don't seem to be increasing. Um, we've got, you know, the challenge of managing technical debt and maintenance, it often crowds out the space for development, you know, the integrations that we want to do like open air, workflow optimizations, automations, um, all of that stuff. And so much attention, I think, across our institutions goes to low level, fairly common denominator technical concerns, you know, these can be security updates and all sorts of other things, um, but really at the expense of achieving higher value mission and purpose aligned activity, which is, you know, what the repository is all about at the end of the day. Um, content recruitment, curation, long-term preservation, importantly, ad advocacy, you know, for open, for fair, for doing things that will change the culture and uh, academia and research. So, you know, how could it be um, if we can try to position repositories, I think, a little bit more as infrastructure, which isn't always the sexiest, flashiest thing, but is something that we can depend on. Maybe that chart starts to change the frame a little bit more in terms of how we think of the need to depend on the repositories as, and the repositories as a network as we go forward. What if there were more software as a service, you know, made available by trustworthy open principles aligned organizations, ideally owned and administered, um, you know, within the institutions that we belong to, the academy? What if mission and Christian, mission critical activities such as you know, open advocacy, preservation, all of those sorts of things could really truly be prioritized from a local to a national level, knowing that we need to, don't need to fuss as much about some of those underlying transactional technologies. You know, they can be stable, they're more predictable, they're collectively used and attended to. And you know, I think that begins to afford us the opportunity to look at interoperability in all sorts of new ways in terms of um, in terms of uh, interoperability and next-gen functionality, more likely to be available and adopted and developed in a more predictable fashion. So what, what is being proposed for national infrastructure, at least at the level of repository, and there's lots of different ways that infrastructure can be conceived of, but I think, you know, in terms of repository and repository platforms is to look to establish an op in bilingual, multidisciplinary, multi-tenant Canadian institutional repository service, one that could be shared and supported by institutions um, like those represented on this call. It's the service that could open that could support open discovery, sharing, stewardship, preservation, the basic you know mandates of uh, a repository in the Canadian research landscape. What it's not is most definitely not to replace all the repository services offered institutionally, regionally, or otherwise. Um, it's complementary and something that would, you know, ideally create another viable shared service for institutions, ones like my, you know, mine at, at the University of Alberta, who want to to work together in new and different ways. And it prioritizes common goals, needs, and approaches over individual institutional interests. And there's some sacrifice to be made there, absolutely. But you know that's done in order to achieve greater national scale and impact. 
as uh, as well as improve repository interoperability within the larger international scholarly ecosystem. So to be 100% clear, what's not being proposed a single repository to rule them all, that's not what this is about. It's not a solution for every institution and for every repository use case. I've not talked to a lot, but I have talked to at least one institution, maybe a couple that you know feel pretty good about where things are at with their repository, and that's totally okay. This is, you know, I think a next step for those institutions that maybe don't feel that way and that are at crossroads and are looking to um, to work together um, as opposed to invest as much as they have been doing at the local level. Um, it's absolutely not a reason for organizations to stop investing in local teams either. When I look at this through the U Alberta uh, lens, I, you know, am very, very clear with our teams and with those that I work with that what we want to do is maximize the expertise, the experience, the ability of our local teams to do more than just the stuff that is grinding them down to a nub, which is really, you know, fairly, again, fairly low level technical stuff that just seems to occupy all the time and space for our, our work. There's all sorts of work to be done and contributed to on the level of integration and interoperability and those sorts of things, which I mean, digital preservation is, is a great example of that as well, which we know we need to get to, which will more than occupy the time and attention of our local teams. So if anything, it's a, cry to invest more in those local teams. Um, very quickly, high level strokes here is that, you know, a lot of time to date has been trying to round up conversations and gather information from stakeholders across the, the country. There's been some meetings of the Carl leadership, the directors, you know, to ensure that there's buy-in and support for moving ahead. Um, I'll reference that Regional organizations like OCOL have also struck working groups that are looking at the opportunities of shared repositories, you know, that within the, the scope of their regions. But, you know, we're hopeful that we can expand that out to to uh, to national scope. There's a new uh, Carl Shared Repository Infrastructure Advisory Committee. Um, short form is Syriac, not a great acronym, but that's what it is. That will be meeting soon. Um, a few folks on this call are on that group, but we'll be looking to again, strategize and try to move forward meaningfully, um, a plan to, to, uh, to, to get some uh, traction and uh, action happening in the shortest time frame that's possible. So there, there's much to be done there in terms of startup plans, financial governance models, host organizations, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if we look at examples like Borealis, you know, we can do this. We know that we can do this. There's actually examples of this. This is not just like a dream that sits out there. I think there's some um, very, very, um, you know, very, very good examples that we can can draw from to uh, to inspire us to be able to to make something happen at the national level. My secondment ends at the end of August, but that doesn't mean that the work ends. That just means that's when my agreement ends. But maybe that's a useful um, hole to plant in the ground in terms of trying to, to move forward with um, some, uh, some speed. So I know that strong communities are really you know, part of the infrastructure, the fabric that we, we build on and look forward to the rest of the panel. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, next, we have Jessica Lang, who is from McGill University. So if you want to turn on your camera. Yes. Um, yeah. There we are. Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. Share. I'm assuming. OK, it sounds it sounds. Is it looking right? It's not on the yes. right thing. It, it is OK, good. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, Jeff. That's. I know a lot of people are very interested in hearing what Jeff had to say. Um, and so my talk is a little more focused on, I guess, what we do specifically at McGill. Um, so I think it's important to understand a little bit of context at McGill. So we run on the software Samvera. I've always been a little envious of all of the DSpace folks because there's a real strong Canadian community around DSpace. There is not around Samvera. Um, that's fine. Um, but, uh, but so that's the software we run on, but it's also an open source software. Um, we have a service model of mediated deposits. So we we handle all the deposits that come into the system for uh, things like articles and research objects. Although for our electronic theses and dissertations, that's done some semi-automatically um, 
in contact with our graduate studies office. The staff is really just two people. Um, <laughs> so it's me and uh, my colleague Jennifer, who is our repository manager. So Jennifer handles sort of the day to day of deposits. I am the one doing, I guess, strategy and outreach and things like that. Um, and then, of course, we have some part time students that help out. Uh, I wanted to highlight my background. So I, I was a business liaison librarian before I moved into this. And I think I think what you'll see as I talk about um, I talk, I'm going to talk a lot about outreach and engagement. And I think a lot of that is built on my past experience in more of a front facing or public service role. Um, so this is something I've been really I, I've been particularly proud of that we were able to do at McGill. We've worked a lot. We've been able to work a lot with our office of sponsored research. So uh, I remember when I started in this job, I was like, well, you know, the tri agency gives these grants every year, like someone at McGill must have a list of these people like this is publicly available information. Um, so we worked really yeah, hard to go over several meetings um, and now we're at the place where I know the people at the Office of Sponsored Research and every year I get sent a list of everyone who's been awarded a tri agency grant. So sure, CIHR and CERF or FRQ because those grants all have open access requirements. And so I get a really beautiful Excel spreadsheet that has an email, the department, the name of the grant, and then I just divvy that up to the liaisons and I say, oh, OK, biology librarian, here's the five people in your department who got an NSERC. You know, here's a template email you can send to them congratulating them and letting them know about, about the open access policy. Um, so that's been a it's been a really nice uh, workflow that we've been able to set up with our office of sponsored research um, because now we've developed more connections with them. I personally present in grant sessions, so there's grant sessions every fall about like how to apply for a shirk and I get in there for one or two minutes and mention the open access policy. This has been really in useful because I just get a different set of people like there's people that will then follow up with me afterwards like oh I saw you at the shirk presentation that would never have found me via you know the regular library mechanisms um, as some of you may know the Fonds de Recherche du Quebec Quebec's sort of primary uh, provincial funding agency has signed on to plan s so we collaborated with the office of sponsored research on a campus joint memo that was sent out to all researchers about this revised policy, and then they co-sponsored an information session um, with the library on this topic. So we've just, it's been really good. We've been able to identify, I guess, a strategic, you know, priority where the library's interests and the Office of Sponsored Research interests overlap and really develop a lot of good um, collaboration between the two units. Uh, otherwise, I keep trying. I basically try to get myself in front of people often enough so they don't forget about the repository. So I, we have a liaison model at McGill. Um, so in general, I try to connect with them at least once a semester, and that could be something as small as sending out an email, letting them know about you know a, a transformative agreement we just signed, um, or uh, you know some changes to the FRQ policy. We have a liaisons meeting I've presented at. Um, so I, I try to I try to keep in connection with them because in my perfect world at some point I stop being the person that goes into the departmental meetings and the liaison goes in and, and can kind of do that um, that work. In addition to working a lot with the liaisons, um, I offer annually a workshop called how to make your work open access. It doesn't have to cost money, uh, so I don't offer a workshop saying like how to deposit with the repository because I don't. I don't think that would speak to researchers, um, but this has been a, a pretty well received talk and it's not it's not super sophisticated. It's really just a presentation that says, you know, there's the gold open access route. Here's McGill's discounts and here's the self archiving route and McGill's scholarship. But that's been a really effective means of getting researchers to understand. Oh, I just need to send you my accepted manuscript. OK, um, and what was also really good about this workshop is when I offered it, people would attend that then connected with me as being the person on campus. So when I offered this workshop, I then had follow ups from the neuro. So the Montreal, um, the neuro at McGill is sort of a, a Canadian leader in open science. Um, the Douglas, which is also launching an open access policy. The research equity office at McGill has reached out to me. Um, and these are people who once again may not have found me just looking on the library's website, but because I gave this presentation and explained my job, they made a connection and said, oh, this is someone we should work with. Um, so I've developed a lot of partnerships with those units. Uh, and then just generally having announcements in campus communications. 
We also work to make sure that the service we're offering is good. Like you don't, it's not nice to offer a service and then it turns out it's not a great service. Uh, so uh, for the last two years I've been offering, I send a survey out to people who are new depositors. So we identify people who in the last year, like, you know, had not deposited with e-scholarship before, and then we send them a survey and we just ask, you know, how easy was it? What can we do to improve the service? How did you hear about it? What are your motivations? Um, and this has been really good for just pinpointing some, some little things we can tweak with our service. Um, so for example, I, so I ran this survey just this past summer, I believe. Uh, so by and large, people found it very easy to deposit. We just have an online form people fill out and they attach their PDFs and, you know, it, it is, very, we've really tried to make it easy uh, and then they walk away. 100% um, of the people who did the survey said they deposit, were very likely to deposit again. So that's good. So that to me makes it sound like by and large our deposit workflow is meeting users' needs. Um, it's interesting to see how they hear about it. So you know, these are the top two. There's other categories, but the biggest two are colleagues and liaisons. So that that's good to know. So continuing to target, working with liaisons on promotion um, and sort of that word of mouth. Uh, they, they offered some like what I call process improvements. Someone noted that our file size upload limit was too small. I'm like, oh, OK, so we just increased it. Um, or they noted some of the wording on the form was confusing. These are minor things, but it just helps to us to reflect on what we're doing. Uh, and you can see here that the motivations are highly grant compliance. So that to me means we should continue our strategic partnership with the Office of Sponsored Research because that has been a very strong motivator for people to deposit with the repository. And I just included a just one of those nice warm fuzzy quotes you get sometimes in surveys. So in general, this has been working very well. We've had 130% uh, growth in articles since 2018. Uh, I believe we had about 3,000 articles in the repository in 2018 and now we have over 7,000. Um, so we've we've had a real growth in interest from people with depositing. Um, for example, in the past year, we had 105 new depositors and almost 600 accepted manuscripts accepted or deposited. What we seem to have a snowball effect once people realize, oh, I just have to save that version of my manuscript. Oh, and I fill out this form. Then we have what we call in the best possible sense, repeat repeat offenders or repeat returners. Once people, so we have a number of people who just sort of return and, oh, I got something accepted, send it in. So we've sort of seen um, that snowballing too. And in general, launching an online form for deposit, before we just had an email, people could email, but we, people didn't seem to click for them. So we just made a form and now I find people just stumble on it. And so that's been a really good uh, method for people just knowing the repository even exists and how to deposit it all. In terms of what next, um, we have to kind of up our game a little bit uh, because once again, FRQ signed on to Plan S, we should be meeting the Plan S requirements for repositories. We by and large do, but the main, uh, Sember as it currently stands, our current iteration doesn't have PIDs. We don't have handles or DOIs, so that's something that's very important. Uh, and also looking at the core best practices in a similar light. Uh, I think Jeff spoke to all of this, but so, you know, strengthening preservation practices and accessibility, improving our workflow of getting materials in the repository into the catalog and vice versa, particularly for thesis. Thesis, that's the main uh, workflow we need to work on. Um, and then continue to gather statistics. Prior to about 2018, we didn't really gather deposit statistics very well, and so it was hard to quantify, like, are we growing? Who's returning? Who's depositing? And so continuing to do that has been really good for, like, for advocacy efforts uh, within the library. And then uh, continue to develop partnerships. In particular, we, we need to develop a stronger one with our graduate and uh, postdoctoral studies office with regards to the thesis uh, workflow. And that is a very brief, you know, what we've been doing at McGill, but uh, yeah, thank you. Stop presenting. Thanks, Jessica, that's, uh, that's super interesting. I'm a big fan of surveys, so I'm glad to hear that uh, <laughs> very glad to hear that you were able to uh, get some good information from that. Um, I will introduce our next presenter, who is Pierre Lazou uh, from uh, Université de Laval. And yeah, so if you want to, OK, you don't have slides, but OK, no. go ahead. OK, thanks. Thanks, Judy. Thanks for inviting me to share my thoughts about uh, ER in Canada and their future, maybe. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, you sent a few questions, so I stick to them uh, for, for what I, I'm talking to. As you mentioned, I have no presentation, so you, you have only my humble face to look at. Um, the biggest challenge I see for, for institutional repositories and mine in particular is the technology. Uh, we have a lot of time maintaining it. Uh, we have uh, difficulties in having new features. Uh, we have sometimes uh, limited uh, discovery interface. So uh, not a lot of features to discover content in the ER and more and more content are added to it as the year passed. And also we, we used to have problems with our local developments. We are using the open source platform DSpace and we've made some adjustment, local adjustment of the software and it's it's become a nightmare to, to update. So I would say definitely the biggest challenge for ER is the, the technology. Uh, there's also uh, metadata curation or staffing, but it has already been done. And technology is very the key, I believe, uh, for the future of repository in Canada. How will we choose to, to use it? Should we host? Should we uh, outsource? Uh, should we use it locally? So this is where it gets tricky. Um, regarding the skills, uh, our, in our ER, we operate with uh, coordinating teams. We have some people from Canada, Catalog, Cat, uh, cataloging department. We have uh, two uh, librarians, myself and my colleague, uh, that are dealing with all the technology and the training and advocacy. But for the so for the skills, I believe uh, ER in uh, in libraries may all, libraries have, have all it takes, I believe, to to make an ER uh, better or to make an ER uh, functioning well. Uh, we have metadata expertise. We have training and advocacy expertise. We have sometimes IT services that can help. And we have also uh, all kind of experience with indexing, referencing, accessibility. So it's it's something we have in house. The problem I would say uh, is uh, in the operation how you you put together expertise that are that are uh, sometimes scattered among different library units. So the, uh, Jessica has, has illustrated maybe some some kind of work that is, that seems to work with li liaison librarian to to get some advocacy on campus or on the community. So it's a partnership you need to have with other units this way. It's something that should be done. Uh, we try to do this also, but with uh, less success for, from from now. So and, and another one, another skills I believe, and this is uh, one important point for me. Uh, is to develop experience and skills in working with uh, open infrastructure systems. Uh, we have open source systems, which mean open community. Uh, we need to get involved in them. We need to work with them. And it's, it starts with stopping to do uh, local development to adjust the ER to our local context and be, being uh, trying to work with those communities, which sometimes can be complementary. We, we, they may have IT. Uh, specialists that we don't have in house, they may have other expertise that we don't have. So it's it's some kind of getting together to to move uh, to move ahead. Uh, regarding our community and how we engage with them, as uh, as at McGill, we we also have a partnership with the VP Research. So it's going well for all uh, the the compliance discourse, I would say. So uh, th this open access policies has helped a lot uh, repositories to gather content, but in my sense, it's some kind of a double edge ag uh, argument. This one it helps to recruit, but it also uh, tend to position institutional repositories as administrative tools, because researchers are, are seeing it more and more like a, a conformity system. So I, I put my articles in it so that I'm compliant with the policy. It's not I put my article with, with it because I help open access or I, I put other content to, to get this ER uh, help disseminating uh, open access literature better. So in my sense, it's it's, uh, it's something we, we need to be careful about because it's seducive because it's it definitely as as also uh, Jessica has, has, has mentioned with this discourse, we have a lot of recruitment. We have more articles that coming in, but in a way they're only coming because researchers want to comply not because they, they embrace, let's say, some kind of open access strategy in their way of disseminating their research. Okay. 
other other thoughts regarding the future of ER and the way they uh, they position in scholarly communication? Uh, I, I would I would tend to use two buzzwords here. The first one is the interlinking. So we need to interlink between uh, ER, yes, but also between ER and um, uh, data repositories. We need to link maybe with preprint. We may, we, we may need to, to link with publishing platforms. So there's a lot of uh, reflection we, we need to have around all this interconnecting ER, not only among themselves, but among other kind of repositories. And link, uh, connected to this is the interoperability which is also something we need to think about. And it's not only a technological matter in, in here. I, I, I'm also thinking about metadata, how the way we curate metadata, how do we use control vocabulary to have a, a shared standard uh, among, among repositories? So uh, do we have practice that align with this interoperability, which is not only a matter of technology? And uh, to share a success with us, we with you, uh, what um, what I believe in the last year was, was our success is to get rid of uh, all, uh, the majority, I would say, not all, but the majority of our local development in this space. So we, we and we are, we are trying to get closer uh, to the Lyrasis this space open source community by uh, participating in working groups or participating in the governance uh, and seeing how, how the roadmap is going. Uh, and we, we even contribute some codes uh, rather than developing it and, and staying it in, in, in the repository. So this is, this is we, we've changed our operation so that we, we don't do anything that would uh, divide us from the, from the community in the use of the software. So this is new practices we, we put in place uh, last year. I hope it, it would be a success in the long run, but for now it has revealed uh, to be more, um, uh, to simplify a lot of things. Uh, in the way we're dealing with technology. And that's it for me. Great, thank you so much, Pierre. Um, yeah, it's great to hear both you and Jessica have established really great relationships with your office, uh, with your research offices. That's um, that's great to hear. I know they're, they're great partners to have. Um, next, we have Mike Nason. So if you want to share your slides and then jump into it. We good? I'm going to say yes, we're good. Okay. I assume, yeah, I assume I everything's see. good. I'm just going to keep asking if everything's good. Thanks. For everything's good. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, uh, in very predictable fashion, if you know me, blow through an astounding amount of content in as little time as humanly possible. Um, I titled my talk Solutions Looking for Problems, Looking for Solutions. I think uh, this may resonate with repository managers in general. Um, so it's quite possible you don't know me. Uh, I'm the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, I currently serve as chair of the ORCID CA Governing Committee with CRKN, and I know all of these other lovely panelists with their time together on Carl's or WG, plus a great many other things. I am super bad at saying no. Um, I think we all have that problem. I'm also uh, a member of PKP, uh, where I'm the cross of Metadata Liaison. Uh, I am a white cis settler from the unceded, aka stolen territory of the Mi'kmaq Wallistiquay peoples. Just a short hop from the Wallistook River, a much cooler name than the settler crown St. John River, if you ask me. I'm going to cover three things quickly. Uh, and this kind of touches on a little bit of what everybody before me said. I'm going to talk about narratives. Uh, migrations and metadata. So narratives first. Um, I started my career as an academic librarian in 2013, and at the time, repositories weren't exactly new. Uh, we'd been running an instance of DSpace for some time at the University of New Brunswick, uh, you know, 11 years after the Budapest OA initiative. Um, and setting aside the obvious activism present in this sort of OA movement in general, I would categorize this era of repositories as solutions looking for problems. For us, the utility was very evident. Um, for researchers, maybe maybe less so. What problem does this solve? Uh, you know, for me, capitalism. Uh, but you know, here we are, five years out from Plan S, uh, fresh out of the M list, not so fresh to libraries, fresh onto a picket line, which meant we were inheriting a lot of baggage related to the political situation at the university. Uh, and while I'm at it, solidarity with uh, uh, Cape Breton and uh, Immemorial folks. Repositories were popping, uh, and my imposter syndrome was also popping. Folks are making a lot of really cool bespoke connections with unique features across the country. The repository space was really, really going nuts. Uh, librarians were getting their hands dirty, writing new modules, learning to code, contributing back to open source projects. Um, 
you know, really craft craft repositories, I guess, kind of kind of vibe. It was sort of incredible to go through. We had a new platform, we had some new materials, we had a very experienced dev group. Major props to the development team, uh, the systems group at UMB Libraries. They're incredible. Um, and it was an institutional priority. I felt, you know, kind of like a wizard getting to talk shop and work on code and more about the guts of platforms and metadata. And everybody was sort of spinning up. When they put spinning up in quotes, everybody was saying they were spinning up repositories, new sexy websites with neat, sexy projects. But it was also kind of an intense situation. We had a lot of pressures to manage. Uh, we were all building the plane as we flew it. Um, there was a ton of customization. And then across the country, as you're hearing, platform silos, schema silos, technical silos, you know, someone's on Sembera, somebody's on Islandora, someone's on DSpace. So the community can't really share solutions for all of the problems because everybody's got a different plane they're building. Um, an enormous need for us to prove value, which means that we're constantly agreeing to things we shouldn't do. And then an enormous need to feel valued, which I would argue still doesn't really happen. And I don't think the momentum for OA crested higher in this time than seems nice but flawed. Um, and it felt a lot like it was my job to change academic publishing. Uh, and everybody that I talked to kind of fit one of these four categories. A an ally, and those were sparse, indifferent, abundant, uh, mad about change. Oh, yeah, big time. And then annoyed that I hadn't done more, which was maybe the most frustrating response. We were working really hard to demonstrate value, and this resulted in a lot of poor boundaries. I was relatively confident in this period that I was alone in this, uh, which I think is not uncommon for people who are in that field. Then in 2014, uh, as Pierre was alluding to, the trade agency policy uh, for publications finally provided a problem for my solution. It was like, great, that they have a problem now, and I can solve that problem. Obviously, I don't think OA is a problem, but some people definitely saw the policy as one more thing, and I could finally address a practical need that they were feeling. So fast forward, it wasn't too long after this that I really wanted my job not to be the actual repository and worrying about the repository. I just kind of wished the repository worked uh, so that we could populate it and support it. And running a platform is a lot of work. I think it's less and less common in Canadian schools. Most people just do software as a service these days, but you know, obviously it's, it's labor. Um, maintaining code is an actual commitment, put in all caps here, not all caps, but bold for a reason. And software as a service costs real money, uh, which might give you in a bit of an illusion of manufactured flexibility, right? You're paying for it, so you can kind of just get whatever. But the reality was unmaintained modules and extensions, custom code, technical debt, a lot of concessions, um, end of life for dependencies, which is kind of a downside of these enormous software stacks that require a lot of different dependencies, and unique one-off solutions for political problems, usually in metadata. It turns out that like a lot of cool modules and custom work developed by librarians weren't super likely to be maintained by them because they are not software developers and they have a lot of other responsibilities. So you download a module and it would never get updated. It was something that someone used for a project and then they moved on to other stuff and things were just kind of going fallow. What we needed was a box that worked. Um, I didn't have time or patience, honestly, for the box to be the project. And I think this is not an uncommon situation. I am increasingly confident that I'm not alone in this. And Jeff obviously alluded to this earlier. Uh, also, I'm a little jealous that the RDM people just to get, get to get to get past all of this and agree that Dataverse is good and just kind of solve the problem. That's very annoying uh, that they all learned from our mistakes in this space. So we have a lot of people looking at the old repos and asking, what's next? DSpace 7, something else, a national IR? How do, how do we want to do this next step? What does it look like? Um, uh, it's worth noting that the clock is ticking. A number of the platforms we've invested significant time and money into are at or past the end of the line. Drupal 7 hit EOL in November 2022, which means Islandora 7.x is in the wind. Um, DSpace 7 launch finally means that DSpace 5 and 6 are now community maintained. Uh, and a lot of people are in a situation where they say, how do I move this thing with all of my customizations to a new platform that's going to be incredibly laborious? Um, and it turns out that sunk cost fallacy is a hell of a thing. So maybe in the long run, what we could learn is maybe we should sink less costs. <laughs> we don't need to worry about all of these incredible customizations. People are looking towards Borealis and Herder and OpenAir and, and other solutions. So basically, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here is kind of, kind of the policy, I think, where we should be looking. Maybe we don't, you know, we all need to kind of change this up a little bit. So let's talk a bit about migrations. Um, it feels eerily appropriate that I'm drafting this deck on Groundhog Day. UMB Library is in the midst of migrating to our third repository platform in 10 years. The difference between 2013 and now is that I know a lot more things and also I am tired, mad, and better at advocating for myself. Um, I have overseen two full repo migrations in the last nine years. Uh, DSpace to Islandora and then Islandora to DSpace. 
Um, we investigated a few options and figured, you know, why fight it? Tons of people use DSpace. It's well supported. It has an enormous community. There's a ton of documentation. Uh, all stuff that we learned from working on a much smaller platform, we were missing. We moved from DSpace because it was hard to customize. And a major feature of moving back to DSpace is that it is hard to customize, so we would have a great excuse not to customize it. Um, I think an important thing here is that repos absolutely do not need to be sexy. This is a big priority for us. They just need to work. Um, I often refer to DSpace as the Danny DeVito of repository platforms. It's got a low center of gravity. It's sturdy, hard to knock down. It's well known. Um, it's open air compliant out of the box. It has a huge community lessons 1010 stack, and we don't want customizations. Um, I'm happy to answer any and all questions about the migration and why we went with DSpace, but I'd like to talk a bit about what this migration has taught me, and uh, it's likely I'm already over my time. So let's talk about metadata, which Pierre uh, alluded to. Um, boy, we've taken some real liberties in metadata, huh? Um, so Island Oil used a schema called mods. Uh, it's basically Mark 21 XML. Uh, it's extensive. Um, uh, granular and precise. DSpace uses a schema called Dublin Core. It is very old, frustrating, and kind of stupid, um, which means we're enjoying a classic sort of do more with less scenario, which people in academia are very familiar with. Um, and on the right here, you can see the difference between a name in uh, this XML and then a name in Dublin Core. So we've got, you know, first name, last name, role, and then we've just got, you know, one field with the name in it in Dublin Core. Uh, so I was looking around at what everyone else was doing with Dublin Core because I haven't used DSpace in a long time and trying to figure out where standards were. Uh, and I'll say this for a standard, people have really played fast and loose with their applications of Dublin Core, which has a major impact on the interoperability that Pierre was alluding to earlier. People have made some really divergent and incompatible decisions, and lots of folks have inherited repositories full of these decisions. I'm just got a quick example here of like a way that we disagree on the DC rights field. So some schools will take DC rights and they record it as a license. Uh, so, you know, your copyright license, Creative Commons. And then other schools will take the DC rights field and use it in the way you would use it in open air uh, with a link to controlled vocabulary for the access rights to that work. Uh, DC rights is an important field. <laughs> and we have a fundamental disagreement on where that metadata goes. Who cares? You say, well, you, when you find out that you want to push metadata to Crossref, data site, open air, library and archives, Canada, or whatever else, and you're neck deep in custom crosswalks because you're dealing with all of this sort of slapdash or uh, whatever else um, metadata solutions. So Dublin Core adheres to this thing called the dumb down principle, where in any qualifiers, custom or otherwise must be appropriate for the metadata element you're recording. There are a lot of custom qualifiers, but sometimes this is completely independent of the downstream usability of that metadata. So you've got DC, that's your namespace, metadata, that's your element, and then example, that's your qualifier. Anything that's recorded as DC metadata an example must also work within DC metadata. Um, this has been lost on, I think, a lot of folks. So what ends up happening is they end up stapling a lot of stuff to Dublin Core that doesn't exist at all. And it's very clear to me that a lot of it is related to people trying to describe the organizational structures of their institution or something about the student and not the work itself. So DC degree campus, that's not Dublin Core. DC year graduated, not Dublin Core. DC faculty program, mm -mm. none of this describes the work. It's metadata about the schools and students. We've been kind of roped into describing something just to sort of meet a local need. Uh, why metadata shame? Well, I think because we're moving into this space where the ability to distribute and disseminate our repo holding stuff and infrastructure are increasingly vital. If your metadata is only legible or useful for your institution, you end up having to create workarounds and crosswalks, or worse, it may go completely unused. If it's not readable by people outside of your institution, what's it for? Uh, you might as well not be using a standard at all. I'm not convinced that recording irrelevant or illegible metadata is a good use of our finite time. Um, you can read a path, or read about my path to madness here. I spent a lot of time going over a bunch of people's schemas in, in DSpace to figure out what was up. Um, and it did make me feel crazy. I probably should have just done a whole talk on metadata, but it does kind of make me lose my mind a little. Anyway, a couple of parting thoughts. So I've learned the following. Uh, people have spent a profound amount of time mangling metadata standards in order to improve the browsability of repositories. Almost no one whose opinion you should care about browses repositories. In open scholarly infrastructure, the metadata is doing the heavy lifting. This is a thing that people will say, I really want to browse this thing. But most of the traffic we're trying to get is indexed in other places, Google Scholar or the OA button or you know, other places where people are coming in externally and finding the research that's been properly indexed. Uh, browsing is not, not a big one. Metadata is discoverability. Uh, secondly, boring is fine and no one cares. Uh, repositories absolutely don't need to be sexy. They just need to work. It's fine if they're not flashy. Um, 
probably maybe I'll be a lot further ahead if the original pitches for repositories weren't so focused on like marketing adjacent rhetoric. Uh, and I think that speaks to the conversation that Jeff was talking about earlier about competition, people trying to beat each other with, you know, here's my sexy repository. It's better than this school two towns over sexy repository. Um, you know, if we hadn't been so focused on that, maybe we'd be a little bit further ahead. I think we're well past the era where we need to say yes, just to make people happy. I think we're kind of done proving ourselves in this space. Uh, I hope, I think, um, so we can we can start making these things actually make sense. Um, if you spend too much time staring at metadata schema, you will start to lose grip on reality, uh, which maybe explains why I am the way I am. Uh, and that's it. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, no apologies needed. That was that was great. Um, so at this point, I will turn it over to Nicole, who will open the floor for Q and A's. Yeah, hi everyone. So we're going to do some questions now. You can either ask a question of a particular panelist or direct something to uh, the panel at large. If you just use the raise hand function, I'll, I'll call on people in the order that they that they do that. Or you can also put it in the chat. Uh, Julie will be watching there. Okay, there was a question in the um, in the chat for Jessica. Um, Nicole is wondering whether researchers self deposit or if it is mediated by a library staff member. Yeah, so it's mediated by a library staff member, and it's interesting. I just did a review of a whole bunch of Carl libraries, um, and so us UBC and U of T offer mediated deposit. And I talked to UBC and U of T, and I was like, "Oh, like I'm curious," and they're like, "Yeah, we used to do it the other way. Turns out it was more work for us to check and fix researcher entered metadata than us just to do it ourselves." Um, so I was like, "Oh, that's because McGill's always done mediated deposits. So I wasn't sure I missed something." Uh, so uh, yeah, so we do we do it, uh, yeah, ourselves. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I'm sorry, sorry, I just had Tara's chat question. Uh, I report it internally to the, like the liaisons. So I'll write a blog post. We have an intranet, and so I I've report to the, the library community what the results of the survey are. Um, because I think it's important that the liaisons know that the researchers are finding these service are effective <laughs> so that when they tell them to use the service, they know it's going to work. Um, so I've, but I've only done it internally. I haven't done like an external uh, blog post. Yeah. Mike, I'll ask you a question about metadata. Oh, great. I love metadata. Um, yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, like, you know, going over as you were those stapled on DC fields, do you think, you know, given the limited time, like, are there pieces of some existing repositories that it will be that are fixable? Or do you think like the work involved in doing that, what's going to happen to all of those pieces, do you think? Uh, I think a lot of those things are are solvable problems if you uh agree that some of the problems those things solve aren't all that important um so when we migrated or we're working on our migration from island to dspace um, we had a bunch of custom metadata that was related to departments and faculties um i'm throwing that out <laughs> i don't need it it doesn't matter nobody cares so like i think in some cases we're kind of holding on to this metadata for a local uh a local thing that i i don't think really really matters in the long run and i don't think it actually lends any any utility to users um so yes uh on the other hand some of that stuff probably belongs in other metadata fields the beauty of dspace i guess is that uh i can just open up a big spreadsheet and get to edit in um but for schools with a huge amount of of metadata it's gonna it's gonna stress them out um but you know uh a good big project to work on crosswalks to figure out where metadata should go and what you want to get rid of. I mean, it's not it's not an impossible not an impossible task. And you know, uh, Pierre and and Jeff could probably speak to this too, having been part of the open air sort of pilot testing project with situations how you deal with situations where the metadata doesn't fully match and you need to do crosswalks in OAI PMH to try to get it to match what you're looking for. I mean, it doesn't, you know, even if it isn't right in your repository, as long as you're properly writing the crosswalk out, um, you know, you can you can save yourself some time. So yeah, it's not the not the end of the world. Thank you. There's some conversation going on in the chat. 
Um, Jeff, there's a comment from. Where did it go? People are chatting, so <laughs> it's hard to keep track of everything. Um, I think it was from someone at Matt. Yeah, someone from Matt A. Um, Elizabeth says you've caught our attention. Lots of small institutions like Mount A looking for solutions as a repository's end of life. Um, I was kind of thinking as you were speaking about, you know, how is this going to, what, what's your approach to working with larger institutions versus working with smaller institutions and what kind of benefits do you see this, a, a national IR strategy having for, um, for different size institutions? Yeah, no, it um, most definitely, I think both, I mean, obviously, Carl is, uh, you know, who I'm seconded to, and I think, you know, helping lead some of these conversations, but uh, very much from the, the outset, I think the vision is to make this available to, you know, organizations within and outside of, uh, of Carl's boundaries. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I think is a lot more in common than there is different between these different organizations. Um, what we need to do is look at, again, you know, as Mike and others have put it, I think is a, there's some very common things that, you know, we need these platforms to do, that we need these technologies to do. There should be shared workflows that are extensible across our different organizations. When we need to be unique, I would really, you know, press to understand what those criteria are, why do we need to be unique in those contexts and really try to, to understand that. But I think, you know, regardless of big or small, we collectively have the resources to get the job done. I think working together, um, we can move farther, um, sometimes not always faster. Sometimes, you know, it needs to take a little bit more legwork to get everybody to uh, to agree that, you know, we need to do this. But really, folks, do we need to do this? You know, and so there's a bit of interrogation and negotiation and uh, so forth that's involved in that. But um, regardless, big or small, we're trying to change the scholarly ecosystem and make it a healthier place. We're trying to ensure that, you know, at the end of the day, research can happen. It's not about individual repositories, I don't think, being the best. It's about trying to make sure that we've got this ecosystem that we continue to talk about that's healthy and flourishing and um, leading us to vaccines and all these other things that uh, we need the you know we need to have in the world so um, big and small if we can come together and we can make something work I think in terms of costs there's lots of examples of banding models so you know University of Alberta doesn't need to necessarily pay the same as uh, as a you know a small institution you can scale the the costs and everybody you know what's important i think is that everybody has some skin in the game and that we're all um you know contributing towards i think what what can be very much a shared set of goals built on principles that i think we can arrive at and you know i'm really happy to see organizations like carl and cr can and and others you know coming to to uh, some level of agreement around principles that we do want for this scholarly ecosystem that we we talk about so often. So long-winded uh, answer to your question, but um, it's great, and I'd love to have more conversations. So please reach out any organizations that that uh, do have your interest peaked. It's really wonderful how you know all four of our panelists touched on the idea of the community that we have around repositories. Um, Pierre, I loved what you said about like changing your approach to to divide uh, to abandon anything that was dividing you from the community. Um, we did have a hand up from somebody whose name on their display was Dean of Libraries. So if you are a Dean of Libraries and you had a question for one of the panelists, please go ahead. I am and I do. I'm also and yeah, that's just a weird artifact of how I log into things. Um, it's Michael Vandenberg, uh, Dean of Libraries. Dalhousie. Um, I'm not like taking things over time. It sits on my calendar till 3.30. I've got more time, so I'm happy to sit around and, and ask questions, but I don't know if, if you need to wrap things up so I can always follow up offline. Cynthia, are we okay to go over a little bit? Sorry, I didn't hear your answer, Cynthia. Oh, yes. OK, yeah, um, as long as the panelists have a little bit more time, we can we can keep chatting. Awesome. 
Um, oh, I guess first I just want to say hi, Pierre. It's been a little while, so so go on. Hi. Um, and and then like the the thing that that's kind of striking me about this, like there's so much good content here, and 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 I really appreciate what's happening in this sphere. And you know, there's some of the conversation is about things like technical debt that go along with infrastructure. And um, what I'm also kind of starting to wonder about and think about is if we're accumulating some governance debt in libraries because we've spun up like a number of service areas that are critical and important for what we're doing, but they all seem to have new governance structures attached to them. And that has like a different set of of expectations and, and resourcing requirements around it. So I'm, I'm wondering if that has been part of the, the conversation that's been going on um, in in this in this work from from Carl and that that's been going on so far. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, was a um, you know point that's been raised by you and by by others as we've gone along. Um, and I agree. I think governance can occupy an awful lot of time, um, and we need to I think understand what it is that we're governing and what our goals are that we're trying to work towards as we set up those sorts of processes. So, um, and, you know, a few different ways to kind of look at that, that issue. I think, um, you know, all of us do, all, all of the institutions thinking about shared services need to ask ourselves, what really do we need to be involved with in terms of decision-making? Um, you know, transparency matters. I think we can all agree on that pretty quickly, but, you know, at what tables do we need to be at for all of the various decisions and things that need to be made? We need to ask ourselves what's reasonable and what's worth the time investment required to, to be at all of those different tables. I think sometimes I've observed in the past that we have a huge appetite when it comes to wanting to be there for every single decision, but that makes all of those decisions so much harder to make. And um, sometimes it's kind of counterproductive to what the, the bigger goals are that we've already agreed on that we know we want to move towards. So I think the same, you know, could very easily hold true in the repository space. We need to figure out what's the right balance there. Um, like you said, Michael, there's a number of different repositories and other sorts of services that we've established some pretty functional governance um, you know, bodies to, uh, to help us manage um, through a variety of different methods and approaches, you know, is there convergence that can happen there, depending on if we've got common host organizations, for example, that are operating a repository like Borealis, if Scholars Portal was to offer another repository service, you know, do we really want them to be governed in silos? I mean, is that counterproductive to what our larger goal is here? Are there ways that we could maybe share some of that, uh, that governance and make sure that, you know, we're still getting the right people talking about the right things, albeit you know, in, in uh, different uh, different configurations that are efficient and uh, and make sense. So yeah, it you know again long answer to your question, but yes, there has been conversation about that. I would say overall there is interest in trying to collapse some of the governance that we have, as opposed to trying to add more to it. Um, often, I think Canada is not so big that uh, I mean, as Mike rattled off the list of things that he's involved with. I'm involved in with some of those things, you know, others of you are involved with some of those things. It's sometimes you never quite know when you exit from one meeting to the next, you know, did I actually exit? Cause half the room is kind of the same people. I, you know, we want different voices. We want different people around the table. This is not, you know, to, to argue that we don't need that diversity, but I think there's ways that we can sensibly do this in the scale that is Canada. That uh, that will make this uh, this work for all of our different organizations and use the time and resources that we have available to uh, to greatest impact. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate that response. So I see one question in the chat here from Hansel, just asking if anybody treats the repository as a behind the scenes tool with little care for public facing usability, um, going off of Mike's point that the, the repository doesn't need to be browsable. Um, are, is everybody's repository kind of equally focused on storage and forward facing or, or what are your setups like? Pierre, I see you're kind of laughing there, so maybe if you want to start. 
Yeah, I can start on this one. That's that's what we what we decided to do. We we even if this space comes with a UI, we said okay, we, we, we are a deposit system. So you, you deposit your, your articles in there and then we, we used uh, we call them value added interfaces or services like open air. We work with them a lot to, to get other discovery layer than the one we have and being well indexed in Google Scholar or Google or the the tool that people are using rather than promoting the, the UI as an interface. The, the, it works well uh, during the first year where we only collect articles, but when we added thesis and dissertation, it was different. So uh, it, it's it's difficult. We tend to to have the same discourse and say this space has a minimal interface. You can search. It's an, a simple search, and then you get your content, and that's it. But because we don't want to put effort, let's say, in the community to develop specific features, I I, I, I keep returning to this. But no de no local development, so we need to work on a specific feature, of, uh, and it's complicated. It's a complicated feature. Those, those search engine and how you rebrowse content, you. How you display it? Uh, it's it's the most difficult contribution you had to make to a software. I, I would say even Display Seven, which has accessibility rules for 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 people. So you you have it's it's difficult for developers to comply to those uh, rules. Uh, rather than in the back end, it's it's some some kind of easy if you're a developer, I would say. But the the, the interface, we we we're not promoting it, and even liaison librarians don't like to promote it. To their faculty, so it's it's we tend to to always say you deposit in this space and then you can search it in Google Scholar or Google. That's what we said. It's not the primary interface. Can I just add something quickly? When I when I when I looked at you know I gotta be honest my. My repository was has not been a priority. Like at McGill, I have never felt like mine was a priority, which is fine. But um, we don't have like I would go to when I looked at the fifteen different library. You know, some had metrics and downloads, and like like it looked really nice and like export citations. Like we have none of that. And then what I realized, by, given our deposit statistics, is that I guess researchers don't or whatever they don't care enough that that's what's stopping them. You know, so I you know Pierre pointed you know, grant compliance, but the second most reason was was to make it accessible. Right, like people just wanted it somewhere that was open that could be found and have a link to it, and that seemed to kind of make meet the needs for like eighty five percent of the people who wanted to deposit. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of I think echoing your your points here. If I didn't have to have a browsing user interface for DSpace, I'd be thrilled. Uh, if it was just indexed in another place, I, I I think we've had. If you look at most of the DSpace installs across Canada, the way that collections are organized is based on faculty and department. It's based on the institutional hierarchy, which is madness. <laughs> there's no there's no reason to do that. Nobody goes like, I want to look at all the works. Somebody is doing research, unless they're maybe thinking about what grad school they want to go to, and they can find other ways to get to this information. I want to look at just the output of the history department at the institution that I attend. <laughs> in order to see the papers they've made available. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think I think it, a lot of that stuff is a factor of that. We need to prove our utility to the local institution, right? This idea that we want to, uh, like, hey, if we could use this to showcase all of our works at this department, could we do it? And I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I would love for a use case that I had for you that in which you would care about me. Um, but you know, if if we're you know, my favorite use case for the repository is a situation where somebody looks at an article, all repositories. They look at an article and it says, um, you know, uh, you've got you've got the the open access button or um, you know some other some other thing on paywall, and it says there's a little green icon and you click it, and then you're at a repository and you can access the content. That's that's the value is the accessible versions of those things exposed um i see the thing we get asked for a lot of boutique collection pages in our ir my question is does anybody other than the people who are asking for them want or use them <laughs> that's really the question um sometimes people just want a folder on the internet uh, and they say this is my internet folder and this is where i put my internet stuff and uh i don't i don't know that that's a real use case i guess one, one of the deposit I just want to say, yeah, I've, I've, I've tried not to make our repository the digital dumping ground of the university, because I think there's sometimes a feeling of like, oh, can we just dump all our stuff in this digital bucket? And I'm like, I've got a policy that says no. <laughs> so anyway. 
Well, potentially too, I was going to say, if, you know, repositories are conceived of more as infrastructure as well. I mean, if somebody wants to build a bespoke page, they can build their bespoke page, you know, calling on the, you know, taking advantage of the metadata that we have and uh, again, reliable, predictable infrastructure that they can draw on. But I think so many of our repositories just aren't there yet that something like that is really, you know, a possibility. But I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm with those who have said, I don't believe that's really the business that we should be in. I don't see that scaling. I don't see that as something that's at all sustainable um, to do. And one of the things we need to recognize too is that you know research is portable. The researchers move around too. They're not at a single institution their entire career. And I think we haven't quite come to terms with, with that. Um, you know, there may be a provost, there may be a vice president who wants to drill down into the specific metrics of a department, something like that. But I think the repository is not the tool to do that work. It may be part of the infrastructure, but I think that's trying to make it into a tool that it's really not uh, purpose built to do. Yeah, but Jeff, if I may, that's that's the problem I mentioned when I when I say it's a double edged argument because we 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 have this compliance argument on campus. So people, faculty, especially department or others, they ask, can I can I see what 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 are what is open access in my department? Can I see this and each way you tend to 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 find solution to this, you're going to the the administrative way. So I, I, should we say, uh, Jessica said, we said we have a policy. It's open access to, to content. It's not we don't we don't seek to be an administrative tool. Then uh, go go see elsewhere, and they go to Elsevier and just just you're fucked. But but um, but but it's a key. We we want we want to serve our community and. Uh, I think all we've seen about metadata is always we we tend to when we when we talk about metadata we tend to to speak of this uh, former protocol or IPMH but we uh, DSpace Seven for example or all the technologies have APIs so you you can you can but but the, you're stuck with your metadata problem with those APIs because you're exposing basically your your degree DC degree which has no no meaning so w w what what should they do with this? So we, we have all these things around metadata, normalizing it, uh, getting an agreement on how to use them, and it will make our repository more, more open. So it's not a chicken and egg question, I believe, this metadata. It's a fundamental problem from, from the space. And I also go with metadata shaming. This is, this, we should, we should make it's some a, It's a lifestyle, this. really, if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but, but we need to solve this problem. Really, it's a, it's a, it's an important one. But the, the problem you need to, I mentioned expertise in the library. So the the cataloging department may help, but they they have also their bias in the way they they are thinking about about how to structure uh, content and information and, and how to share it because they're they're most stuck with the mark format, which which has its own universe, I would say. But when you're, you're taking with repository, it's a bit different. So there's a cultural shift in the way you, you're considering metadata when you're you're talking with repository with cataloging department. But but it's a key. I, I'm 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 convinced. If we want interoperability, if we want exchange of information, we need to go this way, and try to find solution. Even if it's to to get rid of this metadata shaming and and say okay, we just threw it away, because it was that's what we done. Uh, as, as we done for the for the local development stuff, we we just do. Uh, it's it's a sacrifice you do. You, you have regressions. You you have to deal with some things that were there that aren't there anymore. But if it's to go further, because you 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 have something common, that I I think it's a sacrifice we should make. And for metadata, it's the same thing. We 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 have all done terrible stuff with the duplicate scheme with with metadata. So. <laughs> Dublin Core, I played, in I played guilty. I played guilty on this one. Yeah, Dublin, Dublin Core is in particular a pretty weak schema, right? It's uh, yeah. it's got it's got some real deficiencies, and uh, a lot of people made up with that with custom namespaces. But instead, what some other people did is just staple stuff onto Dublin Core. Uh, <laughs> that's that's really the big one. It's just kind of adding stuff to a schema where it doesn't belong. Um, and I think even building out language around what what custom schemas should be it was just very clear. Running through like U of O's. Uh, collections and a couple other schools, and I was like, I can see, I can point out each. I I know a faculty member asked for that. I could like see the thing and go, I know exactly why that's there, uh, and it shouldn't be, but I I know why. You know. 
Okay. Um, well, I mean, we're over time. I think we're having a really great conversation. Um, thank you so much to our four panelists for agreeing to share their thoughts today. Um, I think this was really, really a wonderful um, session and yeah, just um, feeling very community based right now. I think we, we've got the energy to make make this community repository happen. <laughs> let's let's do it. Um, yeah, so Julie, any thoughts that you'd like to close on or is there anything we need to housekeep about? Um, I don't think so. Uh, Cynthia, is there anything we need to anything we need to note to wrap up? I think we're good though, and I think we'll just thank nope. thank all of our panelists today. This was super informative. Uh, someone who does not come from the IR world, I learned so much. And um, thank you for all of our to all of our attendees for coming out today. This was. Yeah, this was a wonderful session. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone.